Once upon a time, back in the days of yore, there was a problem, a data problem. The problem starts with a scientist who wants to share his data. His data is contained in a simple file. It could be a binary file, a file that contains raw numbers. It could be a text file, less compact but with numbers stored in a way that is human readable. But it contains numbers, a lot of numbers. A second scientist wants to read that data. The scientist manages to open the file, but all they see are numbers. What do they mean? Which variable is it? What are the units? Is it gridded data or just a function of time? What are the scientists to do? Well, the first scientist could simply tell the second scientist what is in the file. Not very efficient and not very reliable. Not to mention the fact that if the first scientist retires or is otherwise indisposed, well, we can see it's not a long-term solution. Another solution, which was adopted by the model we used in the 1990s, was to provide an example code that reads the data. But what if scientist B can't understand that programming language? and the codes have to be updated in tandem with changes to the data versions. Again, not an ideal solution. What about describing the data in a documentation file, otherwise known as a descriptor file? That is actually the solution used by the program grads. The descriptor file gives the file name of the binary file to which it refers, and then other information such as the name of the field stored in the file and the grid of longitude and latitude points and also time. It works, but it has problems. The descriptor file is very limited in the information it can portray about the data. Scientist B can plot with grads, but most programming languages are unable to handle generic descriptor files. This means that Scientist B needs to write bespoke code in order to read the data. Not to mention the fact that the system is not very reliable. If we imagine the data file as a car and the descriptor file as the key, well, lose the key and the car can't be opened, or start for that matter. How can that happen? Well, easily. What if you decide to rename your data file and forget to update the descriptor file? Come back in six months time and you will not remember which descriptor file belongs to which data set. Well, is there a better way? Well, yes, in fact. Welcome to the world of self-describing file formats. CDF, GRIB, HDF are all examples of self-describing files. But what do we mean by self-describing? Well, we simply take the data file and combine it with the descriptor file. What's more, we design this in a flexible and standard way so that all coding languages can build apps and modules that can easily read the self-describing format. So how exactly does it work in detail? Well, let's imagine a textbook. It has a contents page to outline where to find information in specific chapters and an index to find terms. Information is then arranged in chapters and finally, there is a section on general information that doesn't necessarily pertain to any specific chapter, but to the whole book itself, such as the publisher details, the date of publication, and maybe the copyright information. A net CDF file is very similar. Instead of the contents page, we have a section of dimensions which describe how data may be arranged. Then we have a section of data which contains the specific variables themselves. But in addition to the data values, we also have metadata. This is all of the sundry information that is crucial to understanding what the variable is, its units, a detailed description, and so on. Lastly, we have general information that again pertains to the whole data set. Just like the textbook, this may include details of the publisher, the date of publication, and usage permissions, for example. Let's look at an example. A typical NetCDF file for the atmosphere may have dimensions that include time, longitude, latitude, and height. 
but it doesn't have to include all of these, or there may be other dimensions. If many models were run, a dimension could describe the model number, for example. Next comes the variable section. Here we have an example of the T2M, which is the temperature at 2 meters. It is a function of longitude, latitude and time. So we can sketch the data as a three-dimensional cube. Each cell represents the temperature at that particular location and time. Just as important is the metadata. How do you know that T2M is the 2 meter temperature? Well, an attribute, long name, is there to tell you. Another gives the units, and another may flag the value used to indicate that data is missing in a particular cell. There are other variables, so here for example we have rain, which may also be a function of three dimensions, longitude, latitude and time. But variables don't have to always have the same dimensions, they can have more or fewer. For example, topography is time invariant and is only a function of longitude and latitude. Or you might have time series data that gives the mean value of, for example, carbon dioxide changing as a function of time. Lastly, we have the global attributes that give the all-important general information such as the model version used to generate the data or, for example, the creation center, a contact number and the creation date. Clarity and traceability, that's the aim of the global attributes. You can never put too many attributes in a NetCDF file. So virtually all software has apps and modules that can read NetCDF. But what is more, there are a community adopted climate and forecasting standards for variable metadata, which when followed allow NetCDF files to be easily manipulated and plotted, which we will show in the next video. And that is the beauty of NetCDF. Thank you.